This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Laura Castaneda, Laura Castaneda. I'll be your mistress of ceremonies today. We have a wonderful program planned ahead for you. For those of you that are visiting um, from other cities, welcome to beautiful La Jolla, California, where there's no snow. So thank you very much. Um, to give you a welcome and overview, I would like to welcome Marianne Fox, the Chancellor of UC San Diego as well as Peter Kawe, the Dean of the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, and Alberto Diaz Calleros, the Director of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies. So good morning. The University of California at San Diego is pleased to host this very important symposium as part of our 50th anniversary celebration. The theme of this meeting is, He Who Doesn't Look Ahead Remains Behind. So today we'll cover a wide range of topics from the arts and philanthropy to science and the environment. This is meant to be an open and thought-provoking discussion of Mexico's strengths and achievements, and we look forward to an interesting dialogue based on the ideas that will stem from the program. Thank you to all of our speakers and to the symposium participants. We appreciate your involvement in this very important discourse and welcome you to La Jolla. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as the Dean of the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, uh, I am both delighted that you have graced us with your presence and your friendship today, and I am also uh, feel somewhat like uh, a proud parent in the sense that uh, the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies is one of the crown jewels of our research crown at uh, IRPS. And today we get to celebrate its enormous contributions to our two societies of Mexico and the United States. The question that we really uh, need to think about throughout the day as we go through all the individual topics is the larger web that ties together our two countries and the challenges and the opportunities that lie before us as civilizations who are joined by a common culture of a Western tradition, by a common set of economic interests that grow ever deeper together in a world that is shrinking, and as key players in the emerging 21st century civilization that will be focused around the Pacific. This school was created, uh, like so much of UCSD, on a bet, an intellectual bet, that we understood the changing currents of global history and that the place that the School of International Relations should focus was really on the Pacific, the point where the Americas and Asia meet together and not upon the traditional Atlantic focus of most schools of international affairs. We built a school with a curriculum and a faculty and a research program that was really purpose built for that bet on the future. In thinking about that, we always see these tidal waves of interest that flow through. In the early years of the school, it was Japan. Today, China becomes the dominant theme in the public press. But fundamentally, this bet is about the fact it is the Americas, the, all of the Americas, and all of Asia intersecting that is the pivotal point of this coming century. And for the United States, an engagement with the Pacific that is not a deep engagement and partnership and friendship with Mexico, the world's 11th largest economy, our third largest trading partner, and an enormous source of the people who shape the California society, 
this would be a colossal historic error. So today we come together to celebrate both the fact that there is great research and teaching and friendship built around the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies, and also that there are great works for us to do together. We come today to listen, and as a dean, it's unusual that I listen, uh, and uh, to gather new ideas about how to undertake that common work. And finally, in closing, I want to thank some of our friends in particular. Of course, uh, last night, for those of you who were with us, we heard the wonderful uh, remarks of Council General Remedios Gomez, and we saw today around us the generosity of the Secretary of Tourism of Baja, and I particularly want to thank two of our special friends to the school and the center, Manuel Weinberg, who is with us today, and Hector uh, Tahonar. All of those friends, all of that support is reflected in a classroom today that I will promise you all the IRPS students are saying, where was this room all this time we've been in school? <laughs> so with the notion that we are rising up in our demands on the infrastructure of society, but we're being prudent in its management, let's have a fabulous day together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I want to start on a little bit of a grim note. Um, Mexico is going through a very difficult moment. Uh, just going through the news of the last couple of days, uh, we have truly disturbing news that have made the headlines. Some are big news, some are very small news maybe, um, but, but some of those small news represent huge tragedies for the wives, for the mothers, for the children of the people involved. Um, General Westphal from the US military, he talks about the insurgency and the possibility of military intervention in Mexico. Uh, a widely respected journalist uh, loses her job uh, because she asks about the president's health. Um, 10 young men die in clashes with the army in Tamaulipas. Uh, a so-called hero of Juarez, a man who killed three assailants to defend himself. Uh, he's murdered as a retribution together with his wife. Um, anonymous and isolated incidents, a decapitated body found in Naucalpan this morning, an executed man in Tlanepantla. So one might ask, why are we not here debating these issues? Uh, and make no mistake, we know that the social fabric of Mexico is going through a very difficult moment. Uh, that the capacity of the state to provide the most public, the most basic public good of security is, is extremely strained and challenged to, it, to, the, to an extreme that we hadn't seen for a very long time. Um, and this symposium is not an exercise in denial. And, and I want to make this very clear. Uh, all of us are deeply worried. All of our guests are deeply concerned. Um, and some of us, and many of us, are working to try to understand why and how things got so bad so quickly. Um, but we do want to change the emphasis of the terms of the debate today. That's the exercise that we, we want to collectively do today. Uh, we want to think about the future of Mexico. And the key question I, I want to ask our, our participants, our guests today, is, is the question of how do we harness, how do we bring all the talents of so many men and women in Mexico, um, all the artistic and cultural capital, the whole range of entrepreneurial spirit that is expressed in everyday life in Mexico, and the solidarity and the generosity of Mexicans, how do we harness that to think about you know, a, a better future? Um, at the center, what we do is, is, is very narrow in some sense. We, we do social scientific research, uh, analysis of specific issues. Uh, we, we are social scientists. Uh, and what we you know, sometimes need to do is look at the broader picture and sometimes think about the larger canvas. Um, and this doesn't, say, doesn't mean that the social scientific work we do is less necessary. Actually, I think it is more necessary than ever. We need theoretically sophisticated work that is empirically grounded and that is somewhat validated with what we know and what we see and that we can translate into public policy and into real world impact. 
Um, and this is, this is our ongoing activity. This is our mandate. So we will continue doing that. Uh, but I do want to tell you a little bit about what is the implicit narrative of this you know, broader canvas that our event today uh, is, is meant to be about. So, so we are going to organize our sessions uh, a little bit with some, you know, some ideas of what we thought this, this Mexico moving forward and the celebration of excellence uh, uh, should mean. Uh, so the, the narrative we have is built on the first session on an idea of uh, universalism, if I can put it in those terms. Um, the idea that literature, that sculpture, that art, no, no, no borders, no boundaries, uh, that there is a global recognition of our artists, uh, and that does not require any mental state about Mexicanness. Uh, in, in some ways, this is embraced because Mexicans are citizens of the world. Uh, and our future, in that sense, is not insular, it's going to be global, and it's going to be universal. The second session is a session that celebrates our food and our museums. And the reason why we thought about this is because we want to think of them as the depositories of our identity. Um, so Mexicans, we are deeply embedded in our traditions. We have family values. We share, you know, beyond any of the patriotic feelings or the nationalist feelings, a, a way of being, a, un sabor, uh, a humor, a joy of life that we have in, in our everyday interactions. And, and this embeddedness of, of, of our identity is part and parcel of the way we can cooperate and work with each other. The third session, although it seems that it will be about a very broad and big thing, climate change, sustainability, and biodiversity, the role of science and technology in society, is really going to be about our small homelands, our patrias chicas, our matrias. And the idea here is we want to highlight that within the territorial reach of our country, there is enormous fragility, but enormous potential. And the power of science and technology can transform the way in which we use the resources we have in our territory. But we want to preserve our beaches, our forests, our valleys, and to make the cities and the towns where we dwell livable. And that is, is as much a local as a global challenge. Finally, we have a session where we want to celebrate the entrepreneurial ambition, particularly when it is coupled with generosity. The, the entrepreneurial push, as I said, in Mexico is seen in every individual, at every scale, when women and, and men strive for a better life for themselves and their families. But, but Mexicans are also very generous people. Um, so, so, so we have here entrepreneurs who do not just aspire for material goods, uh, but I think that their aspiration is something about their bonds with their family, their bonds with their friends, their bonds with their community. And, and the remarkable people we have with us together here will talk about how to succeed in a global environment, in a competitive world, a very difficult world for businessmen today, but retaining a philanthropic commitment. And now let's get ourselves to work. Thank you. Thank you for that gracious welcome. And um, our first session is about art and culture. Art and culture have an Im a universal impact. The most accomplished and elite group of artists and intellectuals will discuss how they, cra how their craft rather, is a uni uni uniting force that inspires and reinforces Mexican identity. First, we have Cristina Rivera Garza, a historian and top-selling novelist, and the winner of the prestigious Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz Award. <laughs> yeah. Señor Rafael Tovar y de Teresa, an expert on the history of Mexican art and culture, novelist and former director of the Mexican National Council for the Arts. And Sebastian, an internationally awarded monumental sculptor known for his monumental structures forged in iron and concrete. Bienvenido. And before they get started to set up the scene, Pablo Gomez Cano, a PhD student in performing arts with the Department of Music at UC San Diego, will perform a piece by Mexican composer Gabriela Ortiz 
Sindolida. Well, good morning. Uh, I am a classical musician specialized in the performance of contemporary music. Uh, one of the most important aspects of my work is to collaborate with composers and to create in, in the creation uh, of new repertoire. Uh, this is what uh, brought me to the great department of music here in UCSD. Um, uh, I, will, uh, I will play now a piece that I uh, collaborated with uh, Gabriel Ortiz. Uh, Mexican music is very well known in the world, especially by composers like Manuel M. Ponce, and I just want to show a little bit where has it gone since then. Uh, this piece is a little bit strong, maybe for this uh, time of the morning, but we Mexicans, we like a hearty breakfast. <laughs>
Wow. Thank you, Pablo. I would like to just explain how the symposium will work today. Each of the panelists will come up and they will give a short presentation and then we will engage in some discussion between the three of them and then give all of you a chance to ask any questions. Okay, so, um, Cristina, would you like to come up? Oh my God. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. That was good. That was a very good beginning. Um, I'm very happy. I'm very glad to be here in such a good company. Uh, very glad to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the university where I work, uh, right here in the creative uh, writing section of the literature department. And uh, of course, I'm very glad to look forward to celebrate the future of my country. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, Alberto and Graciela, and for your hospitality over the last two years. Uh, it's been great working with both of you at the center. And um, last year, uh, in August, more or less, I published a book about, uh, based uh, on historical research um, on the files of a medical, of an insane asylum, which was built in Mexico in 1910. I did that in the context of the celebration for the bicentennial of Mexico. And I, even though I had been uh, unsure about the, the, to publish this work, which, which I've been doing research for for a number of years, I thought that it was pertinent to publish that exactly uh, last year, because I, I deeply believe that every time that we speak about our societies, our countries, we should never forget the voice of the weakest of the weak, of those who are most affected by social decisions, social circumstances, um, economic, cultural uh, events as such. So in that occasion, I uh, placed um, a lot of emphasis on the voices of people who were uh, became inmates in this institution, and I wanted to revise the history of Mexico of the, during the early 20th century based on those stories of, of the experiences of these um, poor patients from Mexico, their experiences with, with, with disease, with mental illness. And so the history that we came to know as a result of that is uh, much more complex, is, uh, is painful to hear, but it is also very important, I believe, to keep that in our historical memory. I'm mentioning this because what I'm about to read here uh, is uh, very much related to that kind of um, framework. I, um, I've been thinking, as many of us, of course, here, uh, with great concern about my country. And uh, I, I'm the kind of writer that sees uh, herself, the function of the writer in general, as, uh, as um, um, an agency with, with social responsibility as well. So uh, what you are going to hear me say here, essentially, is that um, in these very dire circumstances that the country is going through, uh, the, the solution, the, the um, contribution that I see uh, culture doing in this, in this process, but more specifically literature and books, is um, intervening that which is very subtle but very relevant, the reconstruction of our social fabric, the, the relationship of society and state, the revalidation of the very idea of citizenship, of dignity also uh, with that citizenship. Um, as, a, as a writer, I'm, I'm usually invited to, to give talks uh, across the country, so I've been to several places lately, places that uh, I've been advised in, in several occasions not to go. And, uh, and of course, those are the places that I've been visiting. Uh, in between September and November of last year, I traveled to northern Mexico, offering a series of readings. I accepted invitations from the Literary Festival of El Bravo, which is celebrated in Ciudad Juarez, the most dangerous city in the world, according to various sources. I also went to Matamoros, Tamaulipas, uh, a border city uh, with Texas, which is, by the way, the city in which I was born and in which I celebrated my birthday last year. And uh, while I participated in the inauguration of a literary festival as well. I arrived to Monterrey later to participate in a book fair on the same day and at the precise hour in which 22 so-called narcobloqueos created a sense of chaos in, in streets and highways of the city. 
In these three places, all of them heavily hit by the violence related to drug dealing and the war on drugs, I witness sadness and despair, fear and isolation, rage, but I also witnessed solidarity and hope. I saw the empty streets of Juarez, where people no longer go out at night or organize parties at home as a way of preventing potential violence. In Matamoros, I heard a single woman complaining about um, the loss of uh, her youth, having to stay at home, she said, without the possibility of participating in any kind of social, more specifically nightlife, because of fear. In Monterrey, where I had coordinated a dinner with several friends, I was advised to stay in my hotel and to avoid completely, if at all possible, the streets. So, as Alberto said at the very beginning of this event, uh, it is not news at all. Serious and very sad events are taking place in my country on a daily basis. This is a fact. Should we talk about this? Is this way of disseminating, is this just another way of disseminating despair and anxiety? Are those who emphasize the seriousness of violence in Mexico exercising a, a form of violence themselves? So questions abound, and I think all these questions are relevant. In my visit to Juarez, for example, I read a poem that included literally the words enunciated by Luz Maria Davila, the mother of two children who were killed with 13 more in the massacre of Salbarcar, more or less a year ago, on June 31st of 2010. Her words were full of rage, were full of, uh, they were wounded words. They were also words full of dignity. Uh, and with those words, she, um, in fact, um, contested the presence of uh, the president of Mexico right there in Ciudad Juarez. She demanded justice for uh, her children and justice for all the children of, uh, lost in, in Juarez. At that point, some thought that bringing those words, that the fact that I was, I was writing a poem, uh, quoting, taking that discourse from the, the arena of public discourse into uh, the page of, of the book. Some thought that this was, uh, uh, but so it was just a way of opening an open wound. Her voice, repeated there, became for some a kind of added torture to, for the victims of Ciudad Juarez. Some claimed uh, the hurt was, was alive and that, um, that we all should be more careful. Days later, I interviewed Luz Maria Davila, uh, um, uh, a journalist from El Diario newspaper in Ciudad Juarez, took me to Salvarcar. I saw the house where the massacre took place um, a year before. I saw the pictures of the boys, beautiful, smiling, brimming with life. And then uh, I cried in front of her. I, I couldn't help it. And in a twist that taught me uh, or reminded me all that I know um, about um, the incredible resilience uh, oof, of Mexican mothers. Um, she consoled me, she calmed me down. Obviously, I will never be a very professional journalist, but uh, I was listening to her. I was trying to be very empathic. I was trying to understand. When I asked her about how pertinent it was for her as a victim of violence to hear those words, her own words, in this other public arena, um, her answer was unequivocal. She said, we need to talk about what is wrong. Uh, we need to describe what is happening. Um, if we ever gonna be willing to fix it, we need to address all these issues. So in many ways, I'm here bringing the message of Luz Maria Davila and bringing her words uh, here to UCSD because uh, she told me it was necessary for all of us to sit down and listen to that and, and pay attention and address those issues. So um, that's when I decided to talk about her instead, to bring her here. Uh, I, I really believe that this is the very heart of my country. This is the reason why a, con a country which uh, such a long history will continue and will survive because of Luz Maria Davila and women and men and children just like her. Mexico will in fact move forward. She is not an isolated 
but um, one in a long history of resistance and community struggle. And this is a woman who even in the deepest of pains um, would prepare coffee and tamales uh, to receive me at her home because you need to know, she assured me, because you have to learn, she insisted. Luz Maria was and is a maquila worker, married for 25, 21 years. She had two sons um, on, on whom the couple invested time and care. It was beca because of them, because of their future, that they worked hard and saved money to move to a better neighborhood, Salvarcar. There, they bought a two-bedroom home, and when they were able to afford it, they expanded the kitchen. They added an additional bedroom. When violence began, began to plague uh, the street of Juarez, and knowing um, that the young boys were especially at risk, the families on her block decided to keep their children close. Instead of letting them go out of night, they decided to turn one of the houses uh, on their street into a kind of community place. I was able to watch over them from here, she told me, indicating the sink of her kitchen. Uh, we would all call each other to see how they were doing when they had parties. Uh, the night of the massacre, one among many, she lost her two children and fami uh, 15 family lost. And I think we all lost, of course. She has since then spoken about what happened that, uh, that night, but more importantly, she has not ceased on her search for justice. She gives interviews. She participated in the vigil uh, organizing the site of the tragedy two or three weeks ago. And as she did with me in our interview, she has spoken about the need to involve the three levels of the government, the local, state, and federal government in the transformation of the city. Uh, she spoke very interestingly about the need to recover public space through activities that uh, I could usually describe as cultural practices. Uh, um, the possibility of just going out and uh, feel safe doing things with families and, and children. So uh, much like the mothers of Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, like hundreds and thousands of women who have, marked, uh, who have been marked by loss and pain, um, she did not speak against the state uh, as much as in favor, as much as, as much as demanding that the state fulfill its role as a safeguard of the life of the community, of the well-being of the bodies that constitute that community. And so, let me join her and, and with people like her who speak of hope today. I just got back also from another trip. Uh, this time, uh, I actually went uh, to Tamaulipas and I met there with a very energetic, dynamic, uh, um, very interesting people. We had, in fact, a very touching um, meeting. It was, after all, my home state. I met this team working uh, in, um, with ideas of culture that are not elite-based, but community-based, horizontal in nature, grassroots in scope, and, um, and, um, and um, from the bottom up. And let me just then finish right now, saying that uh, I met there also a very young girl, Brisa, a 12-year-old girl who actually was interviewing me as the youngest um, uh, journalist that I, that I have ever met. And uh, she wanted to become a writer. She, wanted, uh, she wants to become a writer. She wants to, do, um, she wants to contribute to society. So I see, on the one hand, Luz Maria Davila, and I see Brisa from Tamaulipas in the other. And I see in the middle uh, the existence of Plan Medellin, which is the only evidence that we have uh, uh, of a mechanism uh, able to reduce the levels of violence in a, in a, in a specific uh, cities. Uh, this is not in the imagination of anyone. This is really hard evidence. And that's the reason why I say that uh, based on evidence, uh, any investment that we can um, add to cultural issues, to cultural practices, uh, uh, will and, and will have uh, a great contribution with, with the problems that we're facing right now. Woof, thank you, thank you so much. Rafael. Muchas gracias a la 
Universidad de San Diego por la invitación para estar ustedes con esta mañana, sobre todo con la calidad de los participantes que en los distintos temas, en los distintos ámbitos, creo que entre todos trataremos de dar una imagen global de lo que es eh, México en eh, el 2011, cuál es el país que va hacia adelante, cuál es el país que ha quedado rezagado y sobre todo qué es ese rostro colectivo que tenemos eh, en el mundo que sin duda alguna es eh, el mo del modo más evidente en el arte y la cultura. In arts and culture, I that to take part in arts and culture in terms of the discussion and trying to summarize some general statements regarding several years of cultural continuity. I recall the presentation that we organized a few several years ago to recognize Mexico, which was the 3,000 years of splendor presented in California and Los Angeles in the Metropolitan Museum and in San Antonio. There we began to focus on an idea uh, when Mexico was on the verge of signing the NAFTA agreement that the country and its strengths lie in its cultural and artistic expressions. Taking a look at today's slogan, Mexico moving forward, is critical. What does this mean exactly? Mexico is a name which dates back to the pre-Hispanic era, rooted deep in our tradition, a country moving forward with all the means to integrate itself into the world. But these images are popular in nature, images of artists and higher culture which bring together tradition and transcendence, fulfilling Diego Rivera's message when he said that art in Mexico was so deep and so real because it was made out of the very hands and materials at hand, that there was continuity in terms of talent and the cultural expression. When in 78, the tem Templo Mayor, the temple in Mexico's ceremonial center next to the cathedral, to the Zócalo, when the six 18th century sites began to appear along with the Templo Mayor. Several polychromed blue frogs were found, which are in fact quite a few of the elements which Diego Rivera incorporated into his works, which he was not aware of. He died in 57, that 21 years later, the elements included in his work were in fact underground and that he many times walked over them in the center of the city, which is why the topic of arts and culture is absolutely fundamental to understand what Mexico is as seen uh, looking back and also in terms of how to visualize moving forward. What then created to this atmosphere, which was so inviting, which asked us, all of us, to look at Mexico. These cultural elements, these ele folkloric elements, artistic elements that throughout the various states of Mexico were shown on screen. In Mexico, then, we now have an atmosphere which allows us to understand that arts and culture are a guiding principle in Mexico's history. I'm going to invite you on a rapid overview of Mexico, but practical in nature. When Mexico achieves its independence, the first or second act of Guadalupe Victoria, the president, was to create Mexico's National Museum of History. That was not even a political decision, but rather a decision to understand that 
in this country that had barely achieved its independence was a culture which was born, which required a space where one could exhibit the works that in 19, or rather, when the Aztec calendar appeared, one of the most representative works were incorporated into this museum in recognition of the past, in recognition of our roots. The element which will allow us to integrate the nation, to integrate Mexico. So the first decisions of the 19th century, a great extent of these took place in arts and culture and its legacy. In 42, there were regulations which did not allow for national works of art to depart the country, as had occurred with other civilizations which dated uh, thousands of years back, hundreds of years back. What, when we consider Greece, the imperial colonies and the occasions where cities were looted in Berlin and so on and so forth. It was seen that this not occur in Mexico with this regulatory protective framework. The Mexican Revolution especially considered this, not only in terms of supporting the creativity of artists, murals, in visual arts, in music, in literature, the support of the state to the extent that the state redefined its policy. And this focused more on individual incentives. When we see this guiding principle in terms of Mexico and the arts, I would pose a question as it gave rise to a concern that I have reflected upon these past two years. For Mexico, its history has been important. Why is that? Because during 2010, the date of our bicentennial uh, anniversary, the focus was really rather more festive, isolated cultural activities without having a national sense of awareness, which would lead us to ask, what have we been, what are we now, and what do we wish to be? 2010 should have been the occasion to look at Mexico from various perspectives, to look backwards into history, to look forward, to look externally, to consider our situation globally, to define a project which within a process of democracy can become the greatest of projects. I believe that in, thence, in this sense, Mexico reunites these various elements and that what we should have considered in 2010, we still are uh, in time to consider that. We have the basis of liberalism, which enables us to understand Mexico's constitution and a project based on the illustration, uh, liberalism, and also the moment uh, when independence has been consummated in 2021. This will allow us to confront many of the taboos which have tied Mexico to its past, which have not allowed it to look forward. This is one of the critical issues to reflect definitively on our starting point. Not in vain, these commemorative dates for Mexico, where we've seen that the country's main issue requires that it build the ideal conditions, and I'm referring to education. In Mexico, education is problem number one, two, three, four, and five. All other issues are derived from that. Even the issues regarding lack of safety are a consequence thereof. The adverse consequences of this sector, it's not that it's not been considered, but that the efforts are so 
isolated and uh, spread throughout the country. When the first century, beginning of the independence, Justo Sierra, Ministry of Education, created the university in uh, 1921, its 100th anniversary, Jose Vasconcelos created Mexico's uh, educational policy in 1960, 150 years after the revolution. Jaime Torres Bodet created the new textbooks as well as those which refer to the new cultural infrastructure, the Museum of Anthropology, and the cultural infrastructure and network, which we in Latin America can feel proud of as it's one of the most significant. So with this, I wish to try to respond to Alberto's query that he posed at the beginning. How can we integrate? How can we reflect? How can we consider all this Mexican potential so that they are fully developed and may put forth the best face of our country in terms of leaving aside media and other collateral situations. It is through education the only way to transmit how proud we are of our, of our culture, of the facets of a country that has 3,000 years of cultural continuity, over 1,000 archaeological sites, a country that has over 30,000 historical monuments and a number of extraordinary artists such as Sebastian here with us today or intangible legacies such as gastronomy with Monica Patino, a country of contradictions, tremendous gastronomy, and yet 40 million people who are barely making it in a country where we have an Octavio Paz with extraordinary literature and we still have literacy. In summary, I think that in culture we can understand all these contradictions, but also the tremendous opportunities which a country such as Mexico offers us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having invited me here. In truth, to follow this brilliant man in Mexico's culture, what could I speak to you of? I shall share my personal experience as a creator and Mexican artist. In fact, I am a mestizo uh, mixed of the tremendous Mexican extraordinary race and deep roots which we have as Mexicans to be a universal artist, one requires reflection upon one's origin, one needs to be uh, local, have one's own space, live the surroundings, become entirely familiar with our roots, and sometimes we as Mexicans are unfamiliar with them, although we do carry them inside. So what we express, that's what comes out of us. Mexico is a country that cannot be halted, nor shall it be destroyed in terms of its tremendous cultural roots. Many situations might arise as are occurring, but culture is fundamental. I absolutely agree. Education for Mexico is fundamental. It's the only issue which is stopping us. In fact, it is truth. I'm not a specialist. Surely the specialists will be able to jumpstart Mexico's development within the cultural arena. This has led to a sort of stagnation in terms of where we find ourselves now. As an artist and as part of my cultural body of uh, works, I found that I was truly a Mexican mestizo, uh, convergence of all the roots which we as Mexicans share, the tremendous pre-Hispanic roots, and then without denying it, the profound greco latin Latin perspective to which we are intimately linked. And then the modern world, the information within our global scenario. So I decided to 
recreate a pre-Hispanic history in Iron. I remember the quote that said, one took from the gods to take uh, vitality and to restore it, employing iron and uh, an industrial element and industrial color. So I started with the pre-Hispanic focus first, then to the Spanish Baroque to recreate the Mexican perspective, and I took a tremendous column result of uh, Mexican uh, Baroque style. And in uh, Ildefonso, I designed a retablo, an uh, altar with the 12 stations of the cross or the Via Crucis. This was well received because the Pope then invited me to the Sistine Chapel. Uh, in an encounter with international artists. Finally, I completed my research, mathematical, geometrical, scientific, more so, which was a speculation regarding sculptures as uh, considered from a mathematical and a geometrical perspective. I might be a reflection of what I am as an artist, a cultural mestizo, a mixed uh, race, a mixture of trends, and ultimately what this produced was extraordinary. I'm an artist, as you can see, of monumental works, but so as not to bore you with my discourse, let me show you rather visually works of art which I completed from the end of the 70s. So it's like the seed of what I've done globally on a monumental level. This is called Dorado Cuatro, dedicated to Albert Duro as a, someone who specialized in the field of geometry. It's transformable <laughs> thank you <laughs> now I can't get it back in well this marked the beginning of my career as a sculptor, but even if you consider this to be very universal and contemporary, this is from the 60s, uh, 70s, and it has an element of my pre-Hispanic and Mexican legacy. Shall I show you another? It's called Brancusi for Four, because it's uh, quadridimensional. It's topological geometry as opposed to anything else. You can see it's very simple, minimalist. It's as if it were a tribute to Brancusi. And little by little, it undergoes a transformation. And then here we have the tribute to Brancusi. <laughs> and it returns to its shape as a cube. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, that was amazing. W where do you begin a discussion on arts and culture in Mexico? Um, I think it's, it's probably something that bleeds over into every country in a very positive way for Mexico. What inspires you? Is it inspiration for all of you? What inspires you? Do you get that from your own country, from your own people, or from the places you visited? What inspires you? 
Es, es de las preguntas that is one of the most basic and mysterious questions which can be posed. I am always led to reflect on that which I don't understand. That which offers me resistance is always what causes me to look a little bit further. I think that the immediate experience is fundamental. I was right now looking at what Sebastian was showing us, and I was just thinking of the architectural design of some of the archaeological sites, some of the works, some of the religious archaeological ritual sites, which are amongst the most important. And this is a continuity of that, adapted to a poly chromed language and end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century language with elements that have been recovered from the universal art artistic expression. But here we see the lines of Montalban. We see the lines of the Templo Mayor. I think that that which I mentioned a little bit ago, that it's the same hands and the same materials as we proudly see exemplified in what Sebastian just showed us. Yes, I believe that the points of inspiration that we as artists drink in derive from nature, but nature at a macro and microcosm level, entire uh, aspect of nature, human beings, the green in nature, the microorganisms, the rock crystals, everything which constitutes nature, the nature of thinking we as artists drink of that, we become inspired with that, and we create a kind of second nature which has to do with visual artistic nature. I'd, li I'd like to comment. And, and the applause is for you, Sebastian. I hope, I think there's an element which has not really been considered, and I will say this in front of Dr. Es who is an expert in biodiversity. This accentuated rich biodiversity, which we have in Mexico, is in the origin of the multiplicity of cultures because all of these habitats necessarily required creation of culture, ways of satisfying daily needs, social needs, based upon what nature had given us. So then when we refer to the fact that pre-Hispanic Mexico is practically a single unit, that's not true. Simply put, these were very developed cultural expressions throughout Mexico, which obeyed the law of biodiversity, which is why popular arts, which uh, maintain itself from that tradition is so rich, is so dynamic in Mexico. It contains an element not found elsewhere in Latin America. Popular arts permeates all of Mexico's social demographic classes, not so in the case of Peru, Colombia, and so on and so forth, something limited to the people or the larger or marginated social groups. Here in Mexico, this permeates, it passes through, it becomes transformed, it becomes enriched, and everyone enjoys it far beyond a specific class. What about a message? What is the message that, Christina, I think you were pretty clear, and you were leaving a message with everybody about some of the people that you've met along mm -hmm. your speaking routes, but what, what is the message that you want to make sure when, that you leave behind about Mexico and and, and where the country is. Las, uh, una de las One cosas of the que things that I consider to be very important in terms of writing books, which is what nourishes me, is that it provokes or creates an expression of a specific cultural expression, which allows us the possibility of looking at our world while critiquing it. And this then encompasses any other artistic expression, the idea that what we are living did not necessarily have to be so. It wasn't necessarily its destiny. We have the possibility of intervening in that reality in a dynamic, active fashion. What we do there is we make our imagination, we put it to work uh, the, in terms of critiquing it, in terms of a more subversive format. This offers us a possibility to look at this other possible world, to become citizens that can self-critique our experience and so be able to have a dialogue, which I think is a tradition that needs to be reactivated, to listen as an anthropological exercise.
Uno de ustedes quieren comentar? Would either of you like to comment? That, that voice, which one hears? A German philosopher said, fantasy is a secret voice which not everyone knows how to listen to. In Mexico, that's why creatistic expression, and par pardon my, my, my nationalism, our nationalism that we all speak of. A tradition is so rich, there's an element of fantasy in us as Mexicans that knows how to listen to the multiplicity of voices which accompany one throughout one's daily life. For example, and it was said a moment ago, Sebastian's sculpture, Ricardo Legorreta, Luis Barragan's architecture is but continuity in the best of all senses of pre-Hispanic architecture and culture without saying that they're copying the past. In the case of Juan Rulfo, the language is somehow linked to the language of the popular uh, tales which are vivid and are rooted in old Mexico uh, dating back 200 years. One of our most well-known painters, Toledo, cannot be explained without understanding Mixtec and Zapotec art. But we also have this, this world of contradiction and richness. On the one hand, we have the huicholes with but speaking, uh, relating histories on their altars. And then we have uh, who, Iñarrito, who is going to hopefully produce another Mexican film. So this, uh, Gonzalez Iñarrito, so this continuity create this cultural convergence which makes of Mexico a very unique uh, country Sebastian. and culture. Yes, a minute ago, you for, uh, we referred to the arts and crafts of a, of a country which is absolutely fundamental to more cultured artistic expression, so to speak. It is the essence of a country, and Mexico's arts and crafts are deep-rooted and are broad. Thanks to that, Mexican artists, we, we, we drink in those arts and crafts, that folklore, and we have from Tamayo, Toledo, tremendous artists. Do either of you worry that um, Mexico is seen uh, for only food and music and, uh, and not seen beyond the, the other rich uh, arts and culture that exist? Uh, a lot of movies, a lot of negativity in the media uh, in terms of of your area of expertise? I think we live in a world where it's very easy to move forward with stereotyping. One of the easiest ways to convey information and specifically one of the significant responsibilities of our culture is to turn our focus to less complex scenarios. We spe should speak of everything which is occurring beyond the stereotype, whether it's positive or negative, but rather how does this all articulate to a broader vig vision towards the possibility of bringing in all social groups within a country, the opportunity to really look forward together. That for me isn't so much a matter of choosing which elements we should bring into the discussion, but rather how are we going to treat them? This is so complex, the phenomena which it implies. It's quite delicious too. Books, the glancing, the uh, courage in taking a look at our problems because they are real, but the complexity, the levels which we need to really consider if we need to recreate our social fabric and uh, forge a better society. Uno de ustedes, ¿quieren comentar? Yo creo que todos los países. All countries and all their moments in history have light and dark. Let us not forget Mexico during the uh, 19th century. That was a very dark period, revolutions, uprising, civil warfare, and, and, and very special moments. The 20th century, of a period of tremendous contradictions. Now we find ourselves in an issue which is particularly 
uh, dangerous in terms of how far it can go in terms of lack of safety, but to not speak of this is to deny one of Mexico's realities, and it is to deny the possibility of solving them. And I return to my premise, education necessarily has to raise our awareness that behind this chiaroscuro, the light and dark, which we don't want to look at or which we try to deny, that there is a problem regarding the formation of new generations of a future thinking project, that we all look at a country that moves forward in the most positive sense, but in a more democratic fashion, uh, understandably, because we are no longer a country of a single project. There should be certain common denominators for our well-being, but it is a country that can no longer have a unidimensional perspective as it had for so long. So that's why this kind of, of encounter is so productive, because it allows us to showcase many positive perspectives of our country without, of course, denying the chiaroscuro, the light, dark, which exists in Mexico or in Latin America and anywhere else that we look at in the world. Ni privativo eh, de México ni de América Latina, sino que está para donde voltemos en el mundo. Sebastián. All right, then. I just wish to say that as a Mexican, as a productive artist who creates monumental works, which become symbols of our city, that I have just completed a piece in El Paso, Texas, and will complete another in Ciudad Juarez. None of what happens in Mexico is going to stop me from producing, from making, from creating. I'm going to go to Juarez. I will be in Juarez completing a monumental four-meter-high work of art, no matter what happens. So this is a, a way of facing adversity with an attitude. At this time, we would like to open it up for questions. If any of you have preguntas, questions, and um, we have some roving uh, microphones going around, so just raise your hand and we'll... Uh, will guide the microphone to you. And if you want to direct your question specifically to one of the panelists, feel, feel free to do so, or you can just open it up to anybody. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Juarez. I'm a fellow here at the center. And I want to ask a question to Christine. I was very touched by what your intervention. And I am always touched when I see in my people what you saw in this woman. All this mercy, this compassion, this love, this strength at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you, where, where does this come from? Mm -hmm. What is the source? Because once we find the source, I think we are no longer, wor longer working in the dark. Yeah. Once we find and recognize the source, then our work becomes to give more space to this, to mm -hmm. the source in every aspect of life, culture, art, politics, economics, uh, mm -hmm. everything. I think you're right. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. Um, I, in addition of uh, writing books, I am a historian also by training. And much, much of what I've been doing as a historian has to do with what has been called social history, new cultural history. Uh, it's it's uh, essentially a point of view that uh, it emphasizes um, perspectives from the bottom up. Uh, and something that I've been studying, uh, specifically from the late 19th century through the 20th century, is uh, this very long, very important, very fundamental history of, uh, as I mentioned in, in my talk, of community struggle and, and social resistance. It has been the skeleton, I think, of the experience of Mexico uh, in, in its, uh, in its um, um, relationship with modernity. So I, I, and when I mention uh, this resilience, this resistance, this struggle, I'm mostly thinking about, not, not specifically about politics and the state as an administrative force, but I'm thinking about communities that have come together historically, that have organized themselves uh, through different kind of discourses, sometimes religion, sometimes family, sometimes femininity. Uh, it changes, it varies, it depends on, on uh, geography, um, um, cultural traditions, etc. But I think uh, it's the same um, energy, the same um, 
interest that I've seen, for example, now coming back from Tamaulipas, of uh, several projects that people have been uh, initiating at times independently, at times in connection with agencies of the state. But for example, pr trying to promote um, uh, self um, a, a cultural activities that are, that are self-generated and self-controlled. Uh, there is something that um, a, a man from Nuevo Laredo, uh, his name is uh, Hector uh, Lecanda, I believe, um, organized with young people from his neighborhood. Uh, he was given as a gift uh, the, the, the area in which a maquiladora used to be. And so instead of just uh, letting it go, they created a, a small community where people who uh, before then were um, uh, devoting their time to graffiti. Uh, and so what they did was to, to recover all that strength, all that, all, all that knowledge, all that artistic talent as well, and making it part of the community in, in ways that are more productive and enriching at the same time. So I see the same energy, the same interest for uh, creating community. And I think that's, that's a part that we're missing. I think when, uh, when the state uh, relinquished that responsibility about the well-being of the community, what we are losing is precisely those, those linkages that, that, that are bounding the body of the citizenship to the body of the state. And that is something that mothers around the world, but specifically in Mexico, are, are demanding that that link is, is reestablished respectfully and with dignity. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Let's go to this side of the room, this gentleman over here, uh, the red side. We'll call this the red side with the red microphone in front. Thank you. My name is Francisco Munoz. I'm research associate at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I have a question. I'm, it's not my, really my field, but I would like to ask you this. In the context of generations, in the context of globalization, in all these recently historical changes in the country, in the past 30, 20 years. The new generations are facing more challenges or less challenges than uh, the panelists who have a career already established and see the opportunity to keep working and doing what they know how to do. But what about those new generations which face problems with the education, face problems with the the inability to enjoy their lives, the inability possibly to express themselves. What about if we have one Sebastian in that group of kids that was uh, killed in that house? Uh, así que mi pregunta so my question is regarding uh, generations and globalization and the historical changes which the country has experienced over the past 30 years. Currently, there are challenges with regard to problems that you found in the past, uh, problems that you have in terms of moving forward. What is your vision? How could, via NIC education, fully a part of this, but how could we move forward given this set of challenges? Adelante con esta serie de problemáticas. Tú eres el especialista en cultura. Bueno, digo, igual de modo muy general. Well, and just responding very generally, I would say that the new generations obviously face new challenges, along with new opportunities. New challenges, it's a country, shall we call it a little more predictable in terms of its social and political reality within all of the challenges and convulsions which we're experiencing, et cetera. It's almost as if it were part of a daily life and part of a democratic normalcy which a society such as Mexico lives. On the other hand, we have competitiveness in terms of jobs, in terms of even cultural creation. It's far greater than what it might have been 20 or 30 years ago. 20 or 30 years ago, there might have been three or four um, 
competitions in terms of literature and another one or two in terms of visual arts. But today, for example, that there may be more opportunities than there were 20 years ago. I recall a program which we structured at Conaculta called Creators, the National Fund for Culture and arts created this program. There were a certain number of applications per discipline, but this time around, the demand has multiplied tremendously. And before, society itself uh, might have focused more attention on other areas. I I'm referring to visual artists, or et cetera, et cetera. They're a little more in this daily uh, struggle. Some of them have even felt the impact upon their vocations. The other extraordinary uh, issue to consider are the tremendous languages now available in terms of expressing oneself. What a multimedia artist or artist could have considered uh, to employ in 1960 has nothing to do with what our current tools allow them to do in terms of their individual forms of expression even, because in Mexico there had not been this cinematographic quality, uh, qualitatively, quantitatively. The conditions did not exist. Technological tools are more accessible, are less expensive than what they might have been several years ago. And so this now forms part of the cultural continuity for the country. One would hope, and I believe that the state has a responsibility, not only society, but that the state makes available these tools, makes available this media, makes them accessible to the uh, action of creating so that this Mexico's cultural creativity not be interrupted. If you would allow me to comment upon that which you mentioned, new technologies and new languages. This exemplifies the opportunities which we have to rapidly incorporate. Last year, I was asked to organize an encounter in uh, storytellers in Mexico. And at the end, I decided to include a series of uh, people who uh, were active on Twitter. And this received a tremendous amount of participation, not only there, but Immediately thereafter, a virtual community was created incorporating the uh, young writers, essayists from Mexico and from other Latin American countries. The idea is that we live and know that in Mexico, one reads little, that the level of literacy is low, that one write little. But we find these other media, we find people reading and producing, which I think to be a very good sign. I think that if we were to invest culturally in these kinds of media, we could find young people concerned with their experience in language and how to employ it and how to reduce an idea to 140 characters, how to create a sense of belonging. We now have an opportunity which young people themselves have opened up to us. It's not even that we need to teach it to them. It's a matter of listening listening attentively to what is transpiring and to invest culturally where they're at, where they're uh, occurring, and to continue with that. Están abriendo, que ni siquiera tenemos que enseñárselas a ellos, que es una vez más cuestión de poner atención, oír muy bien lo que está pasando y, y, y poner eh, nuestras inversiones culturales donde van, ¿no? donde ya están sucediendo, seguirlas apoyando. Sebastian, would you like to comment? From a personal perspective, as an artist, I believe that art, fundamentally art or the arts, from uh, the era of the cavemen have been global because they don't require translation, because the idea and the artistic vocation is to be universal, to be a language that can be read anywhere in the world, to start off with. As an artist, what I have sought is to be global, to create this, these kinds of work around the world, art not requiring any translation. And I'm sorry, I 
Well, there was something else that you mentioned. So, sh oh yes, oh, of course, of course, of course, of course. Yes, absolutely. It is fundamental for arts in our era. And arts, science, technology have been fundamental towards the production of art from the Renaissance uh, consciously or subconsciously. Now it's like a flourishing of art, science, and technology. I consider this to be a marvelous future for the arts worldwide. Es como un, un florecimiento de arte, ciencia, tecnología, y yo considero que es el futuro maravilloso de las artes en el mundo. ¿no? Gracias. We have time for one more question. Anybody on this side, right here in the front? I wonder if you could address the, uh, some of what's been going on lately with uh, the, the whole narco violence and all this, sort of in the context of, uh, of Mexico's history of, of art and culture. If you look way back to the uh, uh, pre-Columbian era, there was always a lot of violence, but there was a lot of art. And it always, it's, it always seems like the art is almost, uh, almost goes hand in hand with, uh, with some of the most violent uh, periods in Mexican history. Indeed, uh, after that, we had the, uh, the war for independence, and, uh, and then there was the, uh, the revolution. But there was always art, uh, you know, one after the other. And people almost look at what's going on right now, and they ask, you know, how could this happen? Uh, you know, uh, how is this possible? And it just seems to me that it's not that, it's not that, uh, it's not that out of context within the Mexican, within the whole Mexican uh, experience. Well, so I think you're very right about the presence of, uh, of violence uh, throughout the history, not only of Mexico, I think it's, it's, it's something that we shared as a species, right? Uh, but um, about the, is the specific shape that it takes right now uh, and its relationship with the production uh, uh, of literature, I, I, I think is, is, um, is a very interesting moment. Uh, we find uh, a whole group of writers, mo um, most of them from the north, but not necessarily from the north of Mexico, producing works that explore their reality in ways that are very creative, very critical. Uh, Elmer Mendoza, who is a writer from Culiacán, will be here in town, by the way, uh, uh, by early March, um, is writing novels that, that uh, are, pay a lot of attention to the rhythms and sounds of, of language as it is practiced in the north of Mexico, and, and uh, in addition to that, obviously, the, the topics and plots and thematics of the books are, are um, very much um, intersecting with this reality. But then we have great um, artists, installers, uh, what is Teresa, what's uh, the okay, last? Uh, yeah, sí, sí. Teresa, her last name uh, sí, sí. escapes me. Margules. Margules, eh, Margules, uh, um, Margules yeah, right. Um, so uh, among, uh, there are all these uh, chronicles, the books that uh, Diego Sorno, a journalist, is writing as well. So we have um, very critical, very powerful energy also trying to address the reality. And I think that's, that's uh, very hopeful. I think that's something that we shouldn't avoid as artists as well. If it, if it is part of that mystery and that enigma and that relationship with language or your media, whatever you're using, I think that's something that, that um, that should be done, and I'm, and I'm, and uh, and I read these books. I look at these works uh, as uh, as a potential mapping that allows me to connect critically with the reality of my country as well. Thank you to all our panelists for taking part.